Dave at the Hand in Hand conference uh, held in Eastbourne working with uh, children and youth. Uh, we tried to do it by Skype, but the technology was not great, ironically. So let's do it this way. Find technology to fix a technology problem. And this is really what we want. We want technology to be our servant, not our master. We still want to be able to connect and communicate. So how can we do that well in the modern age? What we really need to remember when we're looking at this is that we're emphasising the social, not the media, not the technology. Um, in the last few years, marketers have increasingly worked towards looking for common interests to bond over, far more about connecting in niche communities rather than trying to broadcast a message. When you're trying to engage in social media, the same as any other kind of communication, you're looking to both provide information, but also listen to your audience and engage in dialogue. You want to build a community who will be interested in the things that you do. When we talk about online and offline, and some people would say that there's not even a distinction between the two, we're talking very much about two sides of a world that are real. People will talk about the virtual and we don't want to talk about virtual. This is a real world when we're online. It's not the same as an offline world, but real. In the same way as you emphasize different parts of your personality with different people, with your parents, your friends, your kids, online you may emphasize different aspects of your personality in different spaces. But at the center of it all, you are you and you need to be authentic. When we're talking about what's online, we've got to remember that human beings are sat at machines or engaged in machines. They are not being replaced with machines. So every time you communicate with someone, remember that there's an individual uniquely created by God there. Whenever there's a form of new technology in introduced, um, it changes what's possible for us, may stop us doing something else, and changes our social practices altogether. So, for instance, when paper was introduced, it was seen as very disruptive. People can doodle whilst you're talking, and mobile phones have been blamed for a lot of things. But you have to remember it's the person using it, not the te technology that dictates how it's used. Think, with a mobile phone, we can be much more flexible in our plans. But if our battery runs out, are we prepared for how we might have to do something differently? Jake is the son of a journalist who writes in the UK and the US and he saw how his son was really building his life around relationships with friends the same as we've done for years and years and years uh, building a trust relationship there um, a friend of mine James Poulter who is a PR consultant and um, recommends um, works for you version in the UK the online bible um, he describes the recommend recommendation economy where we trust others much more than marketers these days so how do we ensure that there's good content for people to chew on whenever we're thinking about communicating with anyone in any space although we're thinking particularly digitally here we often refer to the values in Galatians 5 22 to 26 uh, to highlight what we should be thinking about before we have put pen to paper or fingers to keyboard or open our mouth. And this is summed up in a change of Psalm 19.14. May the words of my mouth and my tweets, posts, status updates, comments and shares and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. When you're thinking about what you put online, you need to think who might read it. Uh, this is not to scare you into running away. This is thinking about digital literacy. The same as any form of communication, think before you put it down somewhere. If you did put something on paper, someone could photocopy it or take a photo of it. If you write something in a private message, someone could copy and paste or take a screenshot and put it elsewhere. So are you happy that God will be happy with what you're writing? What about your parents? What about your kids? Would you be happy to see it on the front page of a newspaper? And could your worst enemy do anything with that kind of information? Then think maybe you might not want to post that. The better we understand the nature of new technology, and really it's here to stay, the more we're capable of using it well and encouraging all of our community to use it well. Evidence from the study here by Sonia Livingston and her team uh, showed that parents who learn to use technology are better able to help their kids who may be able to use the technology but not necessarily particularly well. 
Their kids were more confident users and able to take advantage of the huge opportunities for new knowledge online. When we're thinking about um, how things work online, it's good to encourage parents and children to think about these areas. Um, we need to think about the permanency and persistence of information once it's online. Ones and zeros don't forget, although you can potentially game it to bring something to the top rather than, you know, and shove something else to the bottom. We're also living in an age of perpetual beta. Once you printed something, you're stuck with it, any errors and all. Online you can change things and it's not always easy to spot the change and it can be difficult to distinguish between originals and replicas. Also think in terms of scalability, you might put out a small message which you thought was just of interest to a small group. The community may pick on a particular aspect of it that you didn't even notice and may amplify that. That may be for good or for bad. And also searchability, anyone can be found and identified online, which can be good and again can be bad. But it is public and we need to remember it's a public space. So this is a little bit from that book, The Parent App, released in 2012. As one might expect, bad things can happen online because they happen anywhere. The technology is incidental. Um, but many of the kind of stats that are highlighted in this book demonstrate that society is safer for children than it ever has been and that each new risk tends to be accompanied by a new way to counteract that risk. We just need to identify those. So, for example, if you're being bullied, you can keep a record of those texts, ring your parents for help, that kind of thing. So we then need to educate children in those kind of skills, to check in with parents, to let someone know if they're worried about something. And I'm developing more of this information in a book that's due out in January 2014 on parenting in a digital age. But I spent most of my time developing the Big Bible Project, initially developed around the Big Read 2011 with Tom Wright's Lent for Everyone Matthew. My brief was do something digital with this book. The church seemed to need encouragement to be digital and there didn't seem to be much positive content online. So we started to encourage more people to blog online about their faith and increasingly think about how the Bible informed that faith. We've had a little fun recently as we start to work through the Bible a chapter a day in Wordle format. The more times a word is used in the chapter, the bigger it will appear in this Wordle. It allows us to look at the Bible in new ways and as a visual person that helps me think about the stories in different sections of the Bible. I wanted to share a couple of stories provided by what we call Digi Disciples. Disciples particularly interested in what it looks like to be a disciple in the digital age. Muriel writes about a friend who developed true relationships with other mums who had attended an event at church. She then became friends with them on Facebook, not with any particular agenda, just true relationships. And then any future events at church, she also talks about those on Facebook. And so people were coming and talking about those events. She then decided to set up a cyber church group on Facebook, uh, allowing a whole load of questions to be asked about prayer and other interesting things. The events have continued to grow. The church has more regular members. And this is a really encouraging story of the use of social media. Another profile raising event was the roving Rev who walked the Lindisfarne way over several weeks. He wasn't particularly tech or social media minded, but a member of the church joined him at points to help tell his story over the journey via a range of social media tools. A particular tool, Twitter, which seems to be the one that's really taking off over the last 12 months, even more than before, has had a fairly unique use. Um, Chris Juby, who happens to live in Durham, tweets one Bible chapter per day in 140 characters, the limit for a tweet. He gained some press interest and now nearly 27,000 people can potentially read the Bible, albeit in short form, every day. And there's people just interested in language joining that. If you want to know about specific types of technology, check out this downloadable file. Uh, they're not all equal. Facebook is not the same as Twitter. It's not the same as YouTube. So they all have different ways of being used. And though for each tool, you can develop your own kind of daily workout. 
the one here it takes me about maybe 20 minutes a day and you've got to think is this worth the investment if you're trying to connect with people on twitter you need to spend a bit of time learning how to use it well it's got to look active to generate interest and you need to be relational with people unless um there are some sites that broadcast but we need to understand why you've got to know the rules before you can break them so i hope you've uh given you some kind of insight into what's going on and i want to thank you for listening and you can find out more on my site at digital fingerprint thank you